and the cultures that we have conquered with uh, capitalism and uh, technology, we have repressed their connection into these intuitive realms. We have established one method for the arbitration of truth, and everything which does not uh, pass through that narrow gate is relegated to the realm of mythology or worse, cultural immaturity. And yet we are the culture that is in crisis. When you go to the rainforest, you don't find cultures in crisis except to the degree that they are being impacted by us. So I believe that it is no coincidence that in this moment of maximum cultural crisis, which we call the 20th century, the hallucinogens, the entheogens, have emerged in Western culture. It is no accident that Wasson made his trip to central Mexico and contacted the mushrooms. What he discovered in the mountains of Mexico was nothing less than Eros, sleeping but alive, the body of Osiris preserved over an entire astrological age, metaphorically speaking. In other words, that to take the mushroom was to transcend the cultural momentum of the past couple of millennia and return to a world where the Logos was a realized phenomena. And we heard from Karl Ruck last night about the Eleusinian Mysteries. This was not a minor phenomenon. Over a period of 2,000 years, everyone who was anyone made the pilgrimage to Eleusis and had the experience. And it put the stamp on Greek drama, Greek philosophy, later Roman politics. All of these things were influenced by the hallucinogenic experience. So our culture, spiritually, has played the role of the prodigal son we, for reasons of ideology, botanical geography, other factors, have not had visionary ecstatic hallucinogens installed in our culture uh, as we perhaps should have over the last uh, several hundred years. Now that is changing. And in order to understand what the change means, you have to look further back in time in fact, past history to prehistory, again to the model of the shaman, not the shaman as anthropologists uh, describe him, but the shaman as shaman dream him, because every shaman looks back toward an archetypal first shaman who was superhuman, who did go to the stars, who could go to the bottom of the ocean, who could move through the gates of death and return with a lost soul. Now it seems to me when you pull back to uh, the perspective of several thousand years, all of history can be seen as an adumbration on this wish, expectation, hope for a superhuman condition, for a transcending of the laws of gravity, of the laws of life and death, into a superhuman condition that was salutary for mankind as a whole. In other words, the shaman as the archetypal perfected man. Now, this afternoon you heard Metzner refer to alchemy as one of the uh, refractions of this concern with the perfection of the spirit. Uh, it is about the projecting of a perfect substance, which is the self purified but it also led to the rise of modern science, basically through a misunderstanding. Now, it seems to me what's happening now is that what Mersiliad called the human desire for self-transcendence expressed through the motif of magical flight has been taken up by the technological society as the idea of space flight. And I'm sure if Tim Leary were here, he could speak to this more eloquently than I can. Space flight is nothing less than the exterior metaphor for the shamanic voyage. In other words, in our terms, for the hallucinogenic drug experience. This is the way that engineers get high. They go to the moon. <laughs> Uh, 
what we need to do to transcend our cultural schizophrenia and to heal the rift between spirit and soul or world and self is to realize something which we all pay lip service to, at least I'm sure all the people in this room pay lip service to, which is the idea that the inside and the outside are really the same thing. But I don't think the cultural implications of that have been uh, clearly drawn. What it means, really, is that all our dreams of transformation have to be realized at the same time and that we cannot go to space with our feet in the mud, nor can we, in fact, turn ourselves into an eco-sensitive, hallucinogenic-based culture on Earth unless we fuse this, these dichotomous opposites. It is only in a coincidentia positorum, a union of opposites that does not strive for closure, that we are going to find cultural uh, sanity. And this is the thing that the entheogens, the hallucinogens, deliver with such clarity and regularity. They raise paradox to a level of intensity that no one can evade. And in doing that, they set the stage for turning yourself into the kind of person who does not insist on having it either or, black or white, and a culture composed of those kinds of people will be a culture more civilized than any that we have seen so far. I, if I can paraphrase Teilhard de Chardin for a moment, he said, uh, or I will paraphrase him this way, when the human race understands the potential of the hallucinogenic drug experience, it will have discovered fire for the second time. And this is what we are waiting for. We are waiting for the discovery of fire so that we can transcend the monkey business and get on with the great business of inhabiting our own imaginations. And it's impossible to take that position without someone saying, Manichaean, dualist, uh, enemy of the body, perhaps. But uh, since the very beginning of culture, what we seem to be are animals which uh, take in raw material and excrete it imprinted with ideas. And we do this on a larger and larger scale, looking toward the day when all physical constraints can be lifted off of us as they are in our imaginations, and we can erect the kind of civilization that we want to erect. And this vision was anticipated by no less a seer than James Joyce, who said, if you want to be phoenixed, come and be parked. <laughs> Up in the end, prospector, uh, here in Moy Cane, we flop on the seamy side. Moy Cane is the red light district of Dublin. But up in the end, prospector, you sprout all your worth and woof your wings. <laughs> this was part of his program. He, he hoped that man would become dirigible, as he put it. And he didn't live to see the revolution of the hallucinogens, but I think had he, he would have felt that... Uh, that man was well on his way to becoming dirigible. And uh, it seems to me that we stand at an enormous threshold. The future of the human mind must uh, loom large in the future of the human species. If it doesn't loom large in the, hum in the future of the human species, then we are in very big trouble. Now, a term that has been applied or was early on applied, though I haven't heard it used at this conference, to hallucinogens was a consciousness expanding drug. And this may not be automatopoeic, but it's certainly phenomenologically accurate and neutral. They are consciousness expanding drugs. And the question, what is consciousness? cannot be divided away from the question, is man good? And this is a question that we have to answer for ourselves because I believe that we are not 
going to extinguish ourselves, but we are going to evade the, uh, the many obstacles that are so obviously ahead of us in the next few years. We are going to reach the threshold of the galaxy, but in what form? And in order for the form in which we reach the edge of the galaxy and present ourselves to the hegemony of organized intelligence that must exist there, in order for that form to be worthy, we are going to have to go with our minds fully illuminated in front of us. And that means that we can have no more truck with the idea of an unconscious of an inaccessible and dark part of the human psyche that cannot be controlled, that is obviously a description of the childhood of an intelligent species. And I believe that these hallucinogens signal the end of that childhood. There have always been individual shaman who have made that transition. And in that sense, the taking of hallucinogens is an anhistorical phenomenon. It has always been going on. But the idea of psychedelic societies is something new. And it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone takes the drug. It merely means that the complexity and the mysteriousness of mind are centered in the consciousness of the civilization as the mystery which it comes from and which it must relate to in order to be relevant. So I'll take a couple of questions. you have left over when you apply a bad theory. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> About this idea that the mind is the central uh, Central. Well, I guess uh, the question is, is there any advice vis-a-vis -vis utilization of materials that would uh, allow you to hang on to whatever perceptions I may have uh, triggered in you? I wouldn't presume to answer that question, but I'll answer another one that might relate to it which is, I think that when you take hallucinogens, you should take an effective dose. And I can't stress enough the importance of lying down and being still in darkness on an empty stomach. I mean, if you want an oral empowerment, that's it. Nothing could be simpler. And yet you would be amazed at the number of people who, when you mention psilocybin, the first question that occurs to them is, will I be able to drive? <laughs> This is, uh... yeah. One more. Yeah. Which way would you categorize NDA? In with regard to what? The well, NDA, the word empathogen or empathogen seems to me very appropriate. It is not a, uh, a powerful visual hallucinogen. I'm very interested in the visual hallucinogens because it seems to me they pose certain fundamental questions about information theory and that kind of thing. Uh, for instance, you know, where do these ha hallucinations come from? These extremely intricate 
far more intricate than any visual scene that your eye falls upon in ordinary reality. These intricate, ever-shifting information patterns, I don't believe that they can be reduced to uh, spirals, lines, and dots. What I see isn't like that. It's more as though you had a holographic hyperspatial radio and you just tune down the dial and here's a desert world in a triple star system and uh, here is a city somewhere inhabited by insectile creatures with a machine symbiosis. Here is something else and it's just flipping by. Um, I would prefer to believe that the human imagination is the holographic organ of the human body and that we don't imagine anything. We simply see things so far away that there is no possibility of validating or invalidating their existence. One more. <laughs> I was interested in the psychotherapeutic of potential for dimethyltryptamine being a short acting tryptamine. Is there enough time within that peak experience to um, benefit from, from any uh, dead rebirth experience, or is it, in your opinion, too short acting drugs have any uh, profound lasting effect? No, I think it certainly has a profound and lasting effect. The very brevity of it serves to convince you that it isn't a drug at all, but that it's carried you into another dimension and back again. And that alone is uh, something to ponder. <laughs> well, I thank you for your attention.